probably there some of the organizers uh, will come uh, to uh, to explain more more details. But just now you can already have a look at the uh, at the posters of both the Poisson School and the Poisson Conference. Well, with that, uh, we are very happy today to welcome Simone Good uh, at Global Poisson, and she will speak uh, on almost complex structures. Uh, transverse complex structures and P0 del Bock technology. So, Simone, I uh, give you the floor. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to first thank the organizers. So, in the last few years, Michel and I have studied distribution associated to an almost complex structure. And the, the aim is to get information about the manifold from information. Uh, on those di distributions and vice versa. And after studying what one calls maximally non-integrable almost complex structures, we um, started to define the notion of minimally non-integrable almost complex structure. And discussing that uh, with our son, Jean, he suggested that uh, we link this notion to the existence of transverse complex structures. So we developed this idea and defined generalized transverse complex structures associated to an almost uh, complex structure. And recently, I saw the paper which was published last year of Joanna uh, Sirisi and Scott Wilson, who define a Dolbo cohomology for any almost complex structure. And in this talk, which is ongoing joint work, so with Michel and Jean, I want to present our geometrical interpretation of the P0 spaces of this cohomology in terms of transverse Dolbo cohomology. So the plan of my talk is the following. I shall first uh, recall what are almost complex structures, define distributions associated to an almost complex structure. Then I shall define those, this notion of transverse complex structure and the transverse Dolboko homology defined by an almost complex structure. Then I shall recall the Dolboko homology for an almost complex structure as defined by Sirisi and Wilson, and finally give the interpretation of the P0 space. And if there is time, I shall finish with a possible notion of minimally non-integrable almost complex structure. So, Let's just recall that we are going to consider smooth real manifolds, which are topological space that are locally modeled on open sets of Rm with smooth coordinate changes. And one says that it has a complex structure, so if it can be viewed as a complex manifold, so if it can be modeled on open sets of Cm with holomorphic coordinate changes. And an almost complex structure J on a manifold M is a smooth section of the endomorphism of the tangent bundle which squares to minus the identity. And as is well known, when you have a complex manifold, you have an associated almost complex structure which maps the tangent vector to the real part of holomorphic coordinates to the tangent vector to the imaginary part. And of course, g over d of d over dy is minus d over dx. And for instance, for the sphere in each plane, this is just the rotation of uh, pi over half. It is well known that if you start with a symplectic manifold, then you say that an almost complex structure is admissible if and only if the tensor GJ defined contracting omega and J is symmetric. 
and so defines a pseudo Riemannian structure. And it is admissible and positive if, furthermore, JG is Riemannian. And as is well known, on any symplectic manifold, you have a path connected family of G admissible positive almost complex structure. And the fact that you have this large number of admissible almost complex structure allows for all the Fleur theory. Um, but here, really, I want to just take a manifold with one almost complex structure and see what I can say about that. And it is said that the almost complex structure is integrable if it comes in the sense I just recalled from a complex structure. And there is the well-known theorem of Newlander and Nirenberg that an almost complex structure J is integrable if and only if what is called its Nyonoise tensor, tensor vanishes the Nyonoise tensor being defined as the 2-1 tensor, which maps X and J on the sum of the bracket of JXGY minus JJXY minus JXJY minus XY. Of course, in the case where you have a symplectic manifold and you have a J admissible, well, it is integrable if and only if uh, M with the metric associated to G is pseudo Keller, meaning that the covariant derivative with respect of the Levi Civita of J is equal to zero. And uh, uh, of course, you have a relation in general that if you start with mg, if you take uh, a j which is compatible with g, and if you take the omega which is defined by j of g x y, then you always have a link between the covariant derivative of of uh, J with respect to the Levi Civita connection and the differential of the form omega, the differential again of the form omega and the Nyonoise tensor. So this shows uh, this links with the usual definition of pseudo Keller, which is a pseudo Riemannian um, space with a compatible J such that uh, the covariant derivative of J is equal to zero or which is equivalent such that it is integrable, the NJ is zero and the differential of omega vanishes. So, what can one say about the Nyonoise tensor? Well, it is clearly skew symmetric and it is antilinear in each variable with respect to J. If you are in the symplectic case, you have a further identity, which is that the cyclic sum over XYZ of omega computed on XY and Z is equal to zero. And if so those are the property of the Nayanus at a given point, and if you look at the space of tensor of the vector space, which has the, the symmetry, it is irreducible under the action of the complex linear group. And if you look at the situation modeling the vector space, modeling the tangent space at a given point for a symplectic, Manifold, and if you look at tensors which have now all the properties, including this third one, we have shown with our student Maxime Gerard that it is also irreducible under the action of the unitary group, which means the group 
of linear transformation of V, which commutes with J and which preserves the symplectic two form at that point, omega. So when you want to have information on a manifold from the Nyonoist tensor, a J, you cannot just say that you want some component of the Nyonoist tensor to vanish. The only natural thing is to say that the whole Nyonoist tensor vanishes, so you are back to integrable things. So that's why we were interested in looking at distribution associated to J. And the first distribution that we considered was the image distribution, which at each point is just generated by the span of the image of the Nyanoy tensor at that point. Of course, if your manifold is of dimension four, at any point you can take a basis con, con of the vector space consisting of x, its image under, under j, y, and its image under j. And because of the properties of the Nyonoist tensor, you have that the image will always be generated by nj of x, y, and its image under j. So the dimension is at most two at each point. You see that the image is stable by J, so at all points it's of even dimension, and you can find examples of manifolds, even symplectic manifolds, with uh, even symplectic groups with invariant, left invariant structures where the, this image distribution can be of any even dimension and can be involutive or not. And in particular, apart from dimension four, you can find J's such that the image of NJ is the whole tangent space and those are called maximally non-integrable. And you have natural examples. In fact, the first almost complex structure which was introduced, which was not integrable, but which had, which had a geometrical meaning was introduced by Eels and Salomon on a twister space. And with John Honsley, we showed that there's a lot of twister space where um, one of the natural, almost complex structure is maximally non-integrable. Misha Verbitsky showed that uh, you have also natural maximal non-integrable J's on six dimensional nearly Kähler manifold. And very recently, Coilo, Placini and Stelzig showed um, H principles, which show that if there is an almost complex structure on M, and if the dimension is at least 10, well, there certainly exists a maximally non-integrable one. Now, if I look at the integrability and at the Nyonoist tensor, the fact that the Nyonoist tensor vanishes can be expressed in a different way. Uh, when you have a J, you can decompose the tangent space at each point into a plus I and a minus I eigenspace for this J. And I shall just write with curly t's 1, 0, and 0, 1, the space of section of those bundle, t1, 0, and t0, 1. And you have bijection between the set of real vector fields on the manifold and section on t1, 0, or t0, 1, given by a plus and a minus, mapping x over 1 half x minus ijx, or x over 1 half x plus ijx. And it is clear that any complex valued vector field x plus y w can be written as the image of by a plus of a real vector field x plus j w plus the image under a minus of the real vector field x minus j w. And I said that an almost complex structure is integrable if and only if the Nyonoist tensor vanishes. But this is equivalent to say that the bracket of two sections of T10 is again a section of T10. And indeed, this is just realizing that if you look at the bracket of two sections of T10, well, 
from the formula above, it is something in T10, so A plus of something plus A minus of the real part, which is xy minus jx jy minus j times the imaginary part, which is plus j of jxy plus j of xjy. And of course, this is just minus nj of xy. So indeed, if the Nyonoist the, 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 the Nyano tensor vanishes, if and only if the bracket of two section of TG1, T10 is in T10. Okay, but I want to study things which are not integrable. So T10 is not an involutive distribution. So what do you do when you don't have an involutive distribution? Well, you try to make it involutive. And one way to make it involutive is to go to the derived flag of distribution. So it's the sequence of distribution for any real or complex value distribution, which starts with the distribution. And at each level, uh, I take the distribution and add the brackets of sections of the distribution at one level before. And the computation I just made here shows that the first derived distribution of T, T10 is T10 plus the image under A minus of all vector fields which have values in the image of Nj. So you have this first derived distribution. Well, it may be or not involutive. So in order to go to an involutive distribution, you make, you make a recurrence on this construction and you go to higher level in the derived distribution and you saw that all the derived distribution will all contain T10 plus A minus of something. So they will all be of the type T, T10 plus A minus of a representation DK. And D1 is the image of NJ. And how do you obtain uh, DK plus one from DGK? Well, you, you know that two, the bracket of two elements in here are already in the image of NJ. You want to have the brackets of two elements of DJ. That's what I wrote here. And you want to have the cross bracket. And you just observe that an element, which is a section of T10, when you do the bracket with an element which would be in DGK, it is again by your formula before A plus of something plus A minus of the real part minus J times the imaginary part, which is plus J of JXM. And you see that this is uh, exactly the lead derivative of J in the direction of M evaluated on X, okay? So it's the same as uh, on JX, sorry. It's M of J of JX minus J of M JX, okay? So indeed, you must have all the image of the Lie derivative of J in the direction of any element in DJ. And so this is clearly the induction formula and each of them is stable under J. Well, again, by induction, uh, TG10 is stable under J, the image of NJ is stable under J. So DGK is stable under J, the lead derivative of J commutes with J, so that's not a problem. And I just have to check that this is true, but if I look at J times the bracket of two elements 
in uh, DJ, I can write that as the bracket minus LMJ of n prime. So all my derived distributions are of the form T10 plus A minus of a real distribution. Those are increasing real distribution, which are stable under J. And so we arrive at the proposition that this increasing distribution will stop. The case derived distribution is involutive if and only if, well, DGK is involutive and has the property that the image of the lead derivative of J in the direction of any section of DGK is in DGK. And of course, this may not happen before you reach the limit. By the limit, I mean the union of all the section of the TGK for all Ks. And this will be written as the section in one zero plus the section in A minus of the union of the DGK. So it's a union of increasing distribution. And this in limit of increasing union of increasing distribution is an involutive distribution, which has the properties that the image of the lead derivative of J in the direction of any vector field in the distribution is in the distribution. And uh, so, of course, when I say distribution, there are all the DGKs are smooth distribution in, in the sense that locally they are spanned by a finite number of smooth vector fields, but the dimension can vary. Um, from point to point. Of course, around a point where it has maximum dimension, you have an open set where it has maximum dimension. And you remember that the first derived uh, distribution was just T10 plus the image of NJ. Well, it, it is involutive if and only if I just need the first condition, the lead derivative of J in the direction of any sections of the image has the as its image in the image of NJ. And this is indeed true because you can see that if you have this first condition, you have automatically the second condition we had, which was that M of NG was itself involutive because if you look at the bracket of an element in the image of NJ and N, just using Jacobi's identity and winging a little bit around, you can say that it's the same as the derivative of J in the direction of N evaluated on GXY plus NJ evaluated on the bracket of X1 and Y minus the lead derivative in the direction of the image under LNJ of X of J evaluated on Y and you do all this minus same formula exchanging X and Y. So you see that here you have a condition really to have the first derived distribution to be involutive, the quickest way to get involutivity. So now I would like to speak about something else, which would be very much related, which is the notion of D transverse structure. So here I want to define D transverse object in a quite general setting for D. So D can be the smooth function of a, uh, an involutive distribution, not necessarily of constant rank, or it can be a limit as the D infinity that we had before, the union, the numerable union of increasing such sets. And of course, if the distribution is regular, and if the space of leaves has a manifold structure such that the projection, the canonical projection is a submersion, 
then what I call object transfer for D should be the corresponding objects on the space of leaves. So let's start with things which are very well known. When you have a submersion and the space of leaf has a manifold structure, you can look at the tangent bundle to the manifold structure and at its pullback as a bundle over M. And this is what one defines the normal bundle, which is canonically isomorphic to Tm of D. And you have a projection uh, from Tm to Q. So what is a vector field on the space of leaves? So a vector field is a section of the tangent bundle. So it can be viewed as a section of the Norman bundle, but which is constant along the leaves. What does it mean constant along the leaves? It means that the lead derivative of U is zero in the direction of a tangent vector to the leaves, where the lead derivative of a section of Q is defined just as the projection of the usual bracket, the usual Lie derivative of f of a lift of u. So a vector field on M, which projects on this section of q. And so a vector field on M will be foliated, defoliated, if one has this condition that the projection is zero, so that the lead derivative is zero. So if the bracket of f in u is in d for any f in d. And of course, to define those foliated vector fields and uh, then, as I said, a d transverse vector field, which would, which would in the case where it's regular when one has a manifold structure and p is a submersion b, a vector field on the space of leaves, well, can be defined in this much more general setting just to have uh, a smooth involutive distribution or a union as dg infinity. So those are, those is, that is for vector fields. It is well known in usual cases. And now what will be a D transverse almost complex structure. So if you are in the nice situations, an almost complex structure on the space of leaves gives a section of the endomorphism of uh, the Norman bundle, which squares to minus one, and which is again constant along the leaves. So the lead derivative of J tilde in the direction of a vector field, which is vertical, so in the distribution is zero. And of course, this lead derivative of endomorphism is the one related to the lead derivative of sections of U that we just defined. And we shall try to write what are the conditions that we get if J is an endomorphism of the tangent bundle, which lifts J tilde. Well, first, you know, we know that uh, if um, f is in d, pi of f is zero. So g of pi of f is zero is pi of g of f. So this means that g of a section in d is contained in d. The second condition is that g hat squares to one. So g tilde squares to one. So you must have that uh, g tilde square of pi of u is equal to minus pi of u, which gives that uh, g square. So this is pi g square. This is pi of g square of u. So this says that c square of u plus u must project to zero. So is in D for any u vector field on M. And then you have this condition that the lead derivative, so LF of G tilde minus G tilde composed with LF evaluated on a section which is pi of u must be zero, but j tilde of pi of u 
is pi of g of u, and Lf of pi of something is pi of the bracket of f and that something. And here Lf of pi of u is pi of fu. I applied j tilde to this, so it's minus pi of j, which is zero, which means that f of g u minus g of f u is zero for any f in d and any u in chi of n. And you see that the condition on the right hand side can be defined again in this much more general setting. And so we shall say that the D transverse almost complex structure is the equivalence class of a section of the endomorphism of M, which maps D into D, such as E square of U plus U is in D for any vector field U, and such that the lead derivative of J in the direction of vector field of U has its image in D. And of course, the equivalence class is when two such Js project on the same J tilde. So J is equivalent to J prime if and only if the image of the difference is in D. So this will, what will be what we call a D transverse almost complex structure. So the next point is to know when is, when is it um, a D complex transverse, uh, a D transverse complex structure. So of course we start with to say that on the space of leaf it is integrable if and only if the Nyonois tensor vanishes. And when you view the almost complex structure on the space of leaf as a section of endomorphism of the normal bundle. This says that the expression on the normal bundle must be zero for any sections of Q which corresponds to vector fields on M. And this is true if and only if. This is just a projection of this expression when you look at foliated vector field. Okay, but now the expression that you have here, if instead of putting minus u, I put plus g square of uv, this is the torsion of the endomorphism j. And this we know is a tensor. So if it vanishes at a given point on all the values at that given point of foliated vector fields, it vanishes identically because foliated vector fields at a given point, when you are in a situation where M, M over D has a manifold structure and P is a submersion, is the whole tension space. And so it is equivalent to say that uh, a D transverse um, almost complex structure is really complex if and only if this expression, which is the Nyonois tensor for J, except that we don't know that J, J squared is equal to minus one, it's minus one up to an element in D, vanishes for all the elements UV in chi of N. You can put the real tensor plus g square, it is the same expression. So this is what we shall call a D transverse structure, because again, this can be defined for any distribution. It doesn't have to be regular, and it can even be done for a limit of that. So I want now to go to cohomology. So I want to have forms. And what is a D transverse form? This everyone knows. It is... Um, Zut. Uh, do you still see me or not? Now we have lost your screen. You so, have lost the screen. Yeah, so we no longer see your, yeah, right. Now it works uh, again. You can share your file, yes. Sorry. Okay, now, now it's back. 
I hope it won't be <laughs> again like that. Mm -hmm. So you all know what a D transverse form is just a form such that the contraction and the lead derivative with respect to any vector field in the distribution is zero. And you know that the differential of a D transform form is against uh, is against transverse. Okay. So if um, I have an endomorphism which defines a D transverse complex structure, well, I can say that a one form is of type one zero or of type zero one or of time one zero if it vanishes on all vector fields of the form U plus IGU and of type zero one if it vanishes on all vectors of type uh, U minus IGU. And we have a splitting because really it has a meaning because you can write one half as uh, omega as one half omega minus uh, I omega composed with J plus one half omega plus I omega composed with J and omega composed with J is indeed again a transverse form because uh, if you evaluate it, so this is for omega a one form, because if you evaluate it on F, it is zero, this uses that G on D is included in D. And if you look at the lead derivative of omega composed with J, well, it's either LF omega composed with J or omega composed with LF. J. This is supposed to vanish. And this, you remember, was a condition that the image was in D and omega vanishes on D. So this is indeed zero. So this means that you have a splitting of D transverse form with respect to any um, uh, to this J and omega K forms K forms valued, of course, complex valued K forms uh, splits into the sum of PQ forms. And now, since the image of the Nyonoist tensor for J is in D, we have that the differential of a PQ form only contains P plus one Q and P Q plus one forms. This, of course, uses the fact that d omega of x0 xp plus q is the sum with signs of derivative of omega evaluated on all vector field except xi plus a sum with signs of omega evaluated on a bracket xk, xl, blah, blah, blah. So you see that if it is of, if omega is of form PQ, in this expression, you have at least, you have to have at least P minus one terms, which are in one zero and Q minus one term, which are in T01 of the analog for J. So what you immediately see is that D omega PQ is certainly always included. You have to have at least P minus one and Q minus one terms. So you can have P plus two Q minus one plus omega P plus one Q plus omega P um, Q plus one plus omega P minus one Q plus two. And what I say is that the terms here automatically vanishes because to compute them, you just have to compute D omega on um, elements, let's say um, A plus X one a plus 
xp plus 2 a minus y1 a minus y q minus 1 but well as again even if j square is not equal to 0 you still say that this is x minus ijx and a minus is one half x plus ijx and um, any element has the same decomposition up to elements which are in d but everything vanishes on d so it doesn't matter so the only term that you have is um, a sum with signs and you have omega and you have to do the bracket of 2a plus And in order that it has a, a value, you have to have the projection into the T01 of that thing. And then you have the, the rest, which are the A plus and the A minus, which are just in the right order. But we have all, already seen that this is minus A minus of NJ of xk, xn. So if the image of nj is in d, this vanishes. And so you don't have these terms. This is a computation which will come back that we have always an ionary tensor arising in this decomposition. So since the differential is computed there, you can write d and d bar the projection on the corresponding factors, and you can define the D transverse del bar cohomology, which is the kernel of D bar over the image of D bar on the corresponding spaces. Now, this was general about transverse um, complex structure. So, now I shall start with the normalmost complex structure, and I shall wonder when does it define a complex transverse structure. So if I start with the normalmost complex structure, and if I take an involutive distribution which is stable under J, then we have seen that this J defines uh, yields a d transfer almost complex structure if and only if the only condition which is left is that the lead derivative of j in the direction of a vector field in the distribution has always its image in the distribution and it is a complex transfer structure if d contains the image of nj but from what I said at the beginning, this says that J defines a D transverse structure if and only if T10 plus D, which is the same as T10 plus A minus one of D is involutive. So you say, you see, because we have seen that the smallest involutive distribution was TG10 plus what we defined as the dj infinity, you see that any uh, involutive distribution should contain this. This would be the minimal one, and that one contains always the image of nj. So starting from an almost complex structure, it defines a complex structure transverse to this distribution dj infinity that we defined. And all our definitions were valid for sections of a distribution or for limits. So they are valid for our j infinity. So you have a corresponding Dolbo cohomology, which I shall call the transverse Dolbo cohomology. And so this is really linked to transverse complex structure. And I want to compute this transverse cohomology in the easiest case, which are the P0. So what is the, the HP0? So it's a set of forms that Delpa is equal to omega zero. 
So it's the set of P forms so that I of F omega equals zero for any F in D, L of F of omega is zero for any F in, so in DG infinity in the distribution that we are considering, it must be of type P zero. So I of Z omega equals zero for any Z in T zero one. And then I have to write that del bar omega is equal to zero, which means that D omega computed on A minus of Y and then A plus of X1 XP must be zero, but this is just the derivative in the direction of A minus on omega computed on the A plus. plus the sum of, I but only take the bracket of A minus Y, A minus of Y and one of the A plus. So you have a sum over the K of minus one to the K um, omega of the bracket A minus Y, A plus X K composed plus and all the rest of the A plus. But this is just the lead derivative in the direction of A minus Y of Y of omega computed on A plus X1, A plus XP. And so you see that my HP zero is just a set of P form such that the contraction of omega and the lead derivative of omega with respect to any vector field in T10, T01 plus DG infinity vanishes. And this is uh, my smallest involutive distribution containing T10. So that is our transverse Dolbo cohomology. What about the Dolbo cohomology, which was introduced by Sirisi and Wilson and appeared in Advances in Mathematics list last year? You start with the same setting. You have an almost complex structure. You look at the decomposition of the tangent bundle. You look at the decomposition of K forms into forms of type P plus Q. And as I mentioned, the differential of a PQ form has four parts a priori into P minus one Q plus two, P Q plus one, P plus one Q, and P plus two Q plus Q minus one part. And you write D accordingly. And now you just uh, use the fact that D square is equal to zero to write, of course, if you have d squared, you shall go to p minus two q plus four, and that's the projects on there, which will be mu bar square, onto uh, p minus one q plus three, you will have mu bar composed with delta plus delta bar composed with mu bar, which is zero. The next one will be mu bar composed with delta plus delta composed with mu bar plus delta bar square is equal to zero. You have, of course, the conjugates, which are the things, and you have an extra one, which is mu bar mu plus mu mu bar plus del bar del plus del del bar is equal to zero. But in particular, you have that mu bar square is equal to zero. So it has a meaning to define the cohomology of mu bar. And you, you look at the PQ space of that cohomology, which is the kernel of mu bar on the space of PQ forms. And the image of mu bar, look that mu bar decreases by one and increases by two. So it's the image of omega j, P plus one Q minus two. 
And on this space, the map del bar induces a del bar tilde. And this is because mu bar commutes, uh, anti commutes, sorry, with uh, del bar. So you can map omega, uh, the equivalence class of a PQ form, to the equivalence class of del bar of omega. And now, because of this last equation, del bar square on the kernel of mu has its image in, uh, on the kernel of mu bar as its image in the image of mu bar, which means that del bar tilde square is equal to zero. And you can look at the cohomology of this delta bar tilde. In particular, it's a bit, and so these are the Dolbo cohomology spaces introduced in that paper. In particular, it is easier to look at the HP0 because of course, if it's P0, you don't, or, or P1, oh, you have that HP0 mu bar is just the set, is just the kernel of mu bar in omega PQ of J and the H mu bar P1 is also the kernel of mu bar in omega j p1. And so you, uh, if you look at the Dolbo cohomology, it is just, of course, you don't have an image here. You don't have pq minus 1. So the Dolbo cohomology hp0 is just a set of p0 forms which are in the kernel of mu bar and in the kernel of del bar. And so now we can try to compute what is this, co this cohomology. And again, what, what does it mean that mu bar is equal to zero? Well, it means that if I look at the differential and if I compute it on uh, two elements, so a, uh, a minus y, a minus z, and then a plus x1, a plus xp minus 1. It must be zero, but the only term is what we computed before. It's minus omega of the plus part, because omega is of type p0. So in order for it not to vanish, you only compute it on plus part. And here you have the plus part of the bracket of a minus y, a minus z, which is proportional to the Nyonoise tensor of y and z. So in order to vanish, it means that the contraction of your form with any elements in the image of NJ must vanishes, must vanish. So you have the first answer that the HP0 mu bar is just the space of complex valued P form such that I um, uh, the contraction of course, with an element of T01 vanishes, that says that it is in omega P, and the contraction with an element in A plus of the image of NJ vanishes. But this is just the derived ideal, well, it's a conjugate of what we did before, the, der the first derived ideal of uh, T01. And so now we want to compute what is the Dolbo cohomology. So we, we have to look at an omega which is in HP0 mu, and we have to say that del bar omega is equal to zero, but this says that d omega on um, A plus of y, and uh, sorry, a minus of y and a plus of x1, a plus 
of xp is equal to zero, but this is the same computation that we already wrote, is that the Lie derivative in the direction of L a minus one of y computed on a plus x1, a plus xp is equal to zero. But this is true if and only if L a minus y of omega is equal to zero because any other term would again involve a bracket of uh, two elements of a minus would be mu and we know that it vanishes on mu. So we obtain that the Dolbo cohomology spaces of order P zero are those complex valued P forms on M such that the contraction is zero for any element in the first derived ideal and the Lie derivative is zero for any element in T01. But if the Lie derivative vanishes in the direction of T01, it vanishes when you take brackets of such elements. So it vanishes on the smallest, on all the T of the case derived ID. So you see that you have that the Lie derivative of omega is zero in the direction of any element in this Tg01. And now you only know that the contraction with the first derived ID is zero, but then you just use that the contraction with a bracket of two vector fields, whether real or complex, is just Iz Lz prime minus Lz prime Iz. And so this shows by induction that it's not only the first derived bracket, but again, it's all derived brackets, which must uh, have the property that the contraction by an element in one of the derived brackets vanishes. And so you obtained the equality, and that's what I meant by giving a geometric interpretation of this P0 Dolbo space. At least I think it's more geometric to think of it as a transverse, usually Dolbo structure, except that I have to um, uh, spread a bit the definition so that it includes um, sections of a distributions with varying dimension and even limits of section, increasing limits of sections of such spaces. And to finish, I would just like to say that we have seen that to have a maximal transverse structure, you have to have the smallest possible um, distribution, which is the derived distribution. So the best thing you can do, if it's not integrable, of course, it's that T101 is involutive. So that's the largest transverse structure. Uh, and this was just T10 plus the image of NJ. And we have seen that the condition for it to be involutive is just that the Lie derivative of J with respect to any section in the image of NJ has its image in the image of NJ. And so this we should call because it, you have the maximal complex transverse structure, we shall call it minimally integrable. And to make it fine, a priori, if the dimension is constant, and even if the dimension is the smallest possible, that's really minimally, minimally non-integrable. And you have examples when you take a complex line bundle over a killer manifold which, uh, with the Hermitian structure, you know that these are parameterized which HM of F with values in C2, but you know that it has a complex structure, so a holomorphic structure on L, if and only if the churn class can be represented by a one-one form. And in all other situations, 
when you have a vertical field, when you look at the tangent space at the point of L, you have a vertical space, which is the same as C, where the complex structure would just be the multiplication by I. You have a horizontal space defined by the connection, but below you have a Kähler manifold, so you can look this, the, the horizontal space is the same as the tangent space on the projection. And so on this horizontal space, you can put the complex structure on M on that tangent space. And if you do, so this gives a globally defined J, and you can see that the, the image of the Nyonaris tensor is the vertical line when exactly the curvature is not a one one form. And uh, so this is an example where, where it's minimally non integrable. And I shall finish here. This notion goes very well in the homogeneous case. Of course, in the homogeneous case, everything is fine because all your distribution have constant rank. So the limit is not an infinite limit. It's always a finite limit. It's always um, uh, well-defined. And uh, if the, for instance, on a group, if the corresponding group are closed, you really have an orbit structure, but uh, in any way you can define those Dolbo cohomology. And here is a few, are a few reference and thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Um, please questions or comments. Uh, uh, I shall stop sharing the screen. That's easier, I think. Okay, okay sure. Uh, yeah, so questions or comments. Um, maybe I, I have a, a short question to, to start with. In, in that last example of uh, Hermitian line bundles, maybe I uh, didn't got the answer in that case. What's the, uh, what, what will be the, the result for the uh, Delbock homology and what, what's the interpretation of it? What's the kind of, suppose, you, suppose it's not a one one form, okay. Fine. So, so if it's not a one one form, you have that the image of NJ will be the vertical line, okay. which means that here you are in the situation where you have really a space of leaves, which is the Kähler manifold below. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, what I call transverse was always the things that you had on the space of leaves. So you will get the Dolbo cohomology of the Kähler of manifold. Of the, of the base. Of the base, yes. Yeah, whenever you have a nice vibration, you just get the Dolbo cohomology of the base. But uh, or maybe... Or my transverse uh, uh, maybe, may, maybe in general, uh, imagine you, you found a nice example where one can compute the Delbock homology. So what what it's going to tell us? Just maybe like some intuition, because maybe maybe I missed that uh, that, that point. Suppose we computed Delbock homology in some interesting example. What is it saying geometrically or like? Well, of of course it's. It's a way to compute a cohomology which regularizes a bit uh, distributions, which can be very uh, singular. On the other hand, um, very often you will get zero. For instance, for a maximally non-integrable manifold, the image of NJ is the whole tangent bundle, so your transverse cohomology will be completely zero. It will be even zero if uh, these increasing derived uh, distribution starting from T10, if at the end you have the whole tangent bundle, you have nothing transverse. In fact, it's a way to measure what is transverse to, to, to this uh, uh, smallest involutive distribution uh, containing uh, T10. 
So, the chemology in low degrees, like H10, H20, uh, do they have some special meaning? Usually, right there, you kind of typically with chemology theories in low degrees, that's where we find some enlightening interpretation. But do, do you have something? We don't have that yet. As mm -hmm. I said, this mm -hmm. is just ongoing work. I wanted to talk about to see if people uh, were reacting that either they knew that or not, but we are uh, yeah, in the process. So we don't have yet interpretation. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, more questions? You can either unmute yourself and or you can raise the electronic hand, please. Um, maybe my last question. Uh, so besides those uh, Hermitian line bundles, what is your favorite example? Is there some really nice example that you, you would recommend when we should think about this story? Um, no, of course you have a Thurston example of a manifold. You, you find examples in, in nil manifold because that's uh, that's where examples do exist of uh, invariant, uh, almost complex structure, which are non-integral. Mm -hmm. And so there you can build all, all, all this uh, in, a nice, in a nice way. But uh, I do not know, apart from my bundle, I don't know yet any meaningful examples, which is not a group or homogeneous, the usual place where people study those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions or comments? Well, uh, if not, uh, thanks again, Simone. Right, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you probably just to repeat, I uh, put the announcement of the Poisson School and Conference in the chat. And uh, I think uh, hopefully at some point soon, the organizers will also come to talk to us about it and to tell us more about it. So thanks again a lot, everybody for participating. Uh, thanks Simon for a nice talk. And see you next week at Global Poisson. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.